Um, first of all, I want to uh, welcome you uh, as uh, as publisher of the uh, Latino Leaders Magazine. You for our uh, members of the newly uh, collected uh, list of top Latinas, top influential Latinas for our 2020 edition, for which I feel very, very proud and happy and, uh, and honored to have you all with us. Uh, all, all your examples in your different areas have been a real role model and an ex example for many, many other Latinas, specifically Latinas, or especially Latinas, that would like to follow your examples. So thank you for that. Thank and you. Then, thank you. I was going to introduce uh, very briefly all of you, so uh, we, we all keep that on the record. And after that, maybe we will just launch the first question, and then I will uh, leave uh, uh, you to uh, start answering in, in the order that you want, uh, but maybe we can we can go and, and do a round. So first of all, we have uh, and, and this is not in any particular order. We have uh, Nora Mai Cadena. Uh, she's founder and founding partner of Mila Capital in Los Angeles. Nora Mai, thank you for being uh, with us. Uh, second, we have uh, Maria Inojosa, founder of Futuro Media. A well-known uh, journalist and a well-known voice in the Latino uh, scene. Maria, thank you for all what you do, and thank you for joining us. Then uh, we have uh, Ana Marie Apila Apilagos, Ag Argilagos, is that correct? Sí, yes, yes. Oh, okay, <laughs> great. A little tricky, uh, <laughs> even if it's in Spanish, but it's a, a little tricky, Argilagos, uh, welcome. She's president and CEO of Hispanics in Philanthropy, uh, a well-known, uh, uh, organization uh, in base, are you still based in San Francisco? That's correct. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, last but not least, as they said, uh, Lily Hill Valletta, a tremendous friend and entrepreneur in New York. Uh, thank you, Lily. Uh, your example, your success story is very, very inspiring. So thank you for joining us also. Gracias. So, uh, all of, in, in all these context of the, uh, of the pandemic uh, and when all of us were suddenly sent to our homes at the beginning of March and, and we didn't know, you know, what was going to happen, the, the, the future really uh, looked and still a little bit uh, look uncertain. But, but at that time, uh, many people were, uh, you know, shocked. Many people remained shocked for the first weeks or days. Uh, trying to figure out how to work from home, how to be productive, how to keep connected, how to keep engaged, not only connected with teams, with companies, with, uh, with uh, customers. So my, my first question to all of you is, uh, wh what was your, your first reaction? Why, how did you adapt it? How did you start the, the transition from the regular work to the first weeks of the quarantine in each of your cases? So um, is there anyone that wants, wants to go first or should I pick someone? Maria. So I think my first reaction, to be honest with you, and it doesn't bring me any pleasure to say this, but I just want to be honest because as a journalist, I always am, is I think I was in a certain level of denial. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I knew that we had to be safe and I knew that we had to wash our hands and we need to be careful, but um, I was quite resistant. Um, so that now in hindsight for me, it allows me to understand what people are going through. But as a company, regardless of how I was feeling, because I was on my way to get on a plane to go to the border of Mexico with Guatemala. Uh -huh. My team essentially had to stop me because they said, what if they close the border and you can't get back? Mm -hmm. That was why I didn't go, not because I was afraid of getting sick. Um, but so my entire team, you know, we, we shut down the office quite immediately in that first, uh, you know, after March 10th and we very quickly transitioned into everybody working from home. Um, and then I got sick with oh. COVID, with COVID-19. Oh. Um, I didn't know that I had it at the time I was too sick to go get tested. Um, and so I think that added a whole other level of just like for the team, how to manage working with somebody who was sick, actually more than one person got sick in our office. 
So I would just say that now where we are now, I feel like it's weird to say, but we've got become very well adjusted. Mm -hmm. If there was that first period of just like not feeling productive and then on top of that feeling sick and all of those kinds of things that one of our coworkers lost his father. So it got very, I, clo I lost a best friend, a close friend. So oh. he got very, very close to us. Yeah. I would say now we are in New York really accepting of where we are mm -hmm. and kind of prepared to, to do the hard work so that we don't have to be here anymore. Yeah. Um, so tenemos los pies bien en la tierra ahora. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Who, who wants to go next? Uh, how about uh, you, Ana Marie? So I was a little bit nervous because I had just done a stint of Seattle, um, the Bay Area, uh, LA, New York, mm -hmm. and all of this. So I was like, whoa, I've been in all of the hot spots. But I think that my first intent, my first inclination was like, hunker down, make sure that everybody that I care about um, and all of our hip familia is safe. And so I think mm -hmm. I took like a like Thursday, Friday, we closed the office that Friday, which would have been March 13th. And closing the office was actually quite easy because since we have offices in New York, in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. Mexico and in, in San Francisco, we already are were semi virtual, but it's like make sure that everybody, both in the family and in the hip familia, all of our staff are taken mm -hmm. care of. What are the policies that we're going to be putting in place, like uh, unlimited sick leave and things like that, so that families, our staff that have families, children, parents, that their caregivers wouldn't be stressed out. I knew I figured that we were going to be hunkering down through June. So I, then I started, I'm one of those people that was looking for toilet paper and um, just <laughs> sure that I had two months of everything because I, I mean, I live in Washington, DC. So we've gone through snipers and 9-11 and all of these yes. things where you need to like be living in your basement for two months. But um, I think after I, I went through that phase of take care of those around you, then we started I, I got into like the productive mode, but that first couple of days, I think I was just sort of like do tactical stuff so I could feel productive, but it was just tactical. It was just mm -hmm. stuff and, and taking care of stuff and putting policies. It wasn't, I don't think I had any, a creative bone in me back then. Lily. I think, um, you know, being in New York city really puts <clears throat> everything in perspective. I think I, I for, first, went into like mama bear mode mm -hmm. with not only my family, but my team. Like I literally started feeling guilty of not being more forceful with people being stubborn and still wanting to go to the office. Um, so then I couldn't even like bear the possibility that somebody was going to get sick because I didn't do something. So I think <clears throat> it was really interesting to see that kick in, you know, my business partner and I are very proud in running a company that puts, it's people first. Um, so we really try to do that. Like, what do people need? How do we extend benefits? I think what Ana Marie was just saying was spot on. Things you never think about, like, oh my gosh, let's reimburse everybody's like increased broadband to work from home. Like, because some people were literally telling us, Lily, I'm going to have to up my like service because this is all we're doing from home. So yeah. it's very quickly block and tackle stuff, right? Very, very quickly. But I think in a matter of days, in that same week, the business realities hit me really, really hard when I realized, and I'll give you a real life example. One of my clients, big, you know, Fortune 100, everything we were doing with them was tied to March Madness, UEFA, y Copa America. So I was like, wait a second, all of that just disappeared. And it became very real very quickly. And instead of kind of crawling into a ball, I think the mama bear instinct was like, what can we create? What do we do? What do we put together in the market quickly? Who do we call? So I think there was a few days of like, is this really happening? Oh my gosh, let me protect my own. And then it was like, okay, warrior mode. We gotta do something different. Let's innovate. Let's call people. Let's call the clients challenge corporations, whatever needed to be done. Um, but it was, it, it's weird. And honestly, it still is. 
um, because we're in New York City and Maria can testify, you know, yeah, you see people, we're resilient, we go out, we're covered, we're distancing, but still it's far from normal. But I think that's how I will describe like protective and very quickly like solutions mode. What do we need to do to survive and thrive? Yeah. Um, All very right. basic instincts, by the way. I think we're seeing the core of humanity of like, what do you do? Like save your acorns kind of mindset. <laughs> it's crazy. Crazy. Nora Mai, would you like to share with us a little bit of your first reaction? <laughs> yeah, so I'm in Los Angeles and, and very much like Lily, you know, my mother says I went into gallinita mode where I was like, <laughs> ¿Dónde están mis pollitos? Let me bring them in. Um, you know, professionally, I'm an investor in the venture capital space, making, uh, making investments in, in tech companies, uh, building what we call tech you can touch. And so I, you know, I was instantly worried not only about our portfolio companies, but also about all the momentum that has been gained by, by female founders and, and, and founders of color. So a lot of Latinos in the venture capital space. And I thought, oh my gosh, what is, what is going to happen this year? So that was, uh, you know, that was panic number one. And, uh, and so what my team did was really pull together Uh, our portfolio and figure out how we could be helpful. We just about paused every other activity and thought, let's focus on the on the the teams we've invested in and and how to make them successful through this time. Uh, personally, you know, I was a I was looking forward to time at home. I have a three year old, and so the the idea of, of staying at home. And by the way, the stay safer at home order was uh, announced March 19th on my birthday. It wasn't exactly the, the best way to celebrate, but, of course. Uh, but uh, I, I also thought a lot about my parents who live nearby, my brother and my sister. And so um, we were alternating orders. And uh, when we ordered, we weren't ordering for you know a family of three, we were ordering for a family of 10. And so we had communal, uh, communal uh, supplies coming in. So very much like like Lady just went into you know how do how do we you know protect what's ours our community our gains um, and and at least hold on during this period. Mm -hmm. So so we have we have here four entrepreneurs, uh, one in the in the nonprofit sector that is suffering from delayed or question investments maybe from donors or from grants that you used to receive. Then we have two entrepreneurs, Maria and Lily, with your own companies uh, providing services and providing products and all that. And then we have Noramai with uh, her financial services and investment world that also has gone crazy. So my, my, my question to you is, I know that no one is safe from being uh, uh, preoccupied <laughs> or concerned about the future. Even, even big executives or, or employees <laughs> Um, are, are suffering from, you know, uncertainty of my job and, and you know, my company is going to survive, things like that. But, but entrepreneurs, I mean, people, you know, uh, having that, that, uh, that uh, uh, struggle in your mind of keeping alive not only yourselves, but a lot of people that depend on you. So, so if I can ask you, in these two months of the quarantine that we have, a little bit over two months, What have been those things or those um, news or those happenings that have <clears throat> gave you confidence? And what have been those happenings or news that still or made you more nervous? So, so we can see the opposites on, on, on both sides. Um, I don't know if, if my question is, is well uh, understood or should I rephrase it? Do, do you mean the positives and the benefits? Yeah, what I, want, uh, what I want to discuss is about certainty here. So, so if we are certain on certain uh, horizons or environments, then uh, our, or our, our uh, mind is a, a different set than if we have uncertainty, right? So, so I, I can answer that in the sense that, um, <clears throat> so as journalists, because <clears throat> even though Futuro Media has Futuro Studios, Where we, are, <clears throat> where we are hired to produce for other people. The reason why we were created was to be a nonprofit independent newsroom, to, to produce independent journalism. And so I think very quickly we understood that this was one of the biggest stories of our time. 
you know, the biggest story prior to this, apart from immigration, the entirety of my career, um, was 9-11. Um, and so very quickly, I think we realized that this was a story that was going to change everything. And <clears throat> I mean, that placed a particular challenge. But to answer your question, I think we understood mission. So even though we were like incredibly challenged, right? Like how do we do journalism without being able to go out onto the street? <clears throat> but we understood mission now more than ever. And increasingly people are turning to us. Our you know, numbers continue to increase in terms of the audience. People wanted to hear from journalists who they trust. And for example, two shows in the thick or Latino USA that they trust to help them to understand what was going on. And so yes. that was for us what allowed us to weather the ups and the downs was the fact that we had mission and we understood we had a historical responsibility to respond in this time. So that when you have, when that's your bottom line, how, did, how well did we do covering this story? Um, that, that kind of changes things. On the other hand, just to answer the, you know, businesswoman's question. Um, <clears throat> I have an incredible team. And so we have been working super hard at securing that grants are coming in that allow us to do the kind of coverage that we need to do. So yeah. we have not been, we have not been resting at any way, shape or form because my company is still profoundly in essence, a, a, a nonprofit. Yeah. Lily, you were going to say something. Yeah. Um, it's been it's been fascinating to watch uh, the the stages, right? So you go from like the survival of the fittest in a way, save your acorns, to you know innovate or die, like to be plain and simple. Oh my God. Um, and in our case, yeah, innovate yeah. or die has come to life in such a profound way oh, okay. that my data analytics team launched a whole new product in three days out of that survival of the fittest. So just to put it in context, um, so what my company does lives in two buckets. There is big data analytics and technology in the way we're disrupting market research, cultural intelligence in that sense. And then there's a whole marketing services side of the business, which is where we do more of the creative work with big Fortune 500. If that side of the house stopped completely, we refocused to say, how can we do what we do best in a way that is disruptive and innovative at a time like this. And that is where the COVID impact meter came to life. That is where even last week, the World Economic Forum tweeted about our work and it was turning capabilities as a force for good, but also as a force for business. And I think that is where sometimes if I wanted to be such a marketer stuck in my ways, there will be no business. So I tell people right now, this is a time when you need to be okay betting in new areas that maybe you're not so comfortable in yeah. or just batting in new places altogether with new partners. Some work, some don't, but hey, you give it a try and put new things into the market that are going to keep you relevant. So yeah. what is it that has changed forever? The need to be relevant, I think, has been dialed up to a whole new era in this time of the last two months. And they need to be digitally ready to morph, disrupt, and evolve is something that everyone is being forced to. So I think that's what has been fascinating for me to see the resilient spirit of my team, because it is my team that does a lot of the work, but also the being fearless about putting all your eggs maybe in a whole new swim lane that you know is the one that is gonna pay off and make a difference in a time like this and be okay putting on hold many others. So that's some of the stuff that we've been kind of juggling in the last few months. And it's paying off, but it hasn't been easy. I'd love to pick up on that um, because for me, it's agility and the ability to adapt quickly. These are the skills that I, we, we always know, known that we need them, but now more than ever, um, being able to pivot. I mean, Lily, you and I teamed up on the Altissimo Live, the concert. Everybody's saying people are not giving right now, but I've seen the collective generosity on, you know, for, um, we raised over $1.7 million, people giving five on five. And people are not, like, after they got over the acorns, I, I see now 
people are really helping each other. And that's when it's going to get us through us. I also see you asking about philanthropy. And um, I've seen that philanthropy is also changing because usually philanthropy works at the pace of a glacier, so slow. <laughs> requiring so many reports and I've seen like in New York for example the fund that came together within hours um, we have several funds the farm worker fund the essential workers fund the um, uh, fund for asylum seekers that are stuck on the Mexico or you know US border um, uh, another fund for small business um, owners uh, these are coming together incredibly quickly so people right now are paying attention you asked about the challenges I'm really worried because as people get more and more fatigued, I'm worried about 2021. Foundations already had their budgets for this year. So these budgets were gonna go out one way or the other. But 2021, when people start like coming out from like what feels like a war and taking a look around, that might be where the retrenchment is. And so we need to think about this as a long-term recovery, not just the immediate relief. Okay, Nora Mai, you want to say, uh, something. So, you know, adding to this idea of agility and adaptability, I want to share the story of one of the, the entrepreneurs in our portfolio who is based in the Bay Area, uh, manufactures in China, and sells to customers in Latin America. And so as, as you can imagine, the waves of her, of her business were just changing quickly. She first experienced uh, supply chain disruption. Uh, and then came the stay in place order in San Francisco, which, uh, which added tension with the team and, uh, and disruption on site. And once that was a little under control and folks were working from home, then came the disruption in Latin America from the customer base. And so this is a team that had to be uh, adapting to situations from month to month. And it's been incredible to see this uh, this Latina founder actually, um, you know, rise to to every challenge and and adapt her team around it. So that's yeah. a it's a shining example. Well, in in our experience uh, as collectors of uh, interviews of successful people, we have seen that uh, crisis brings uh, the best out of people, especially mm -hmm. the best out of leaders. That, that, that there is where leaders are tested. And I have a question for all of you because. Uh, in trying to make a difference between leadership, uh, let's say male leadership and women leadership, uh, it is my impression with all these uh, years of interviewing uh, leaders and, and Latinos and Latinas, is that Latinas have like a, a whole life, a little bit more, you know, whole and, and, and more um, well-constructed than Latinos or than men because Usually Latinas are not only what they do, you entrepreneurs or, or CEOs or, or executives, but you are also mothers and you are also wives and you are also sisters and daughters. And, 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 and that, that situation, which is not always the same for men who, we are, who are more centered on their profession, makes uh, the Latina leader a little bit more uh, 360 degrees <clears throat> prepared. Or, or skillful. So I got the impression that, that women always manage their time better than men. Now, in this new normal, and especially during these months in which you probably were 100% control of your time, uh, including your, your, your children, uh, you two that have small children, yes. Lily and, and Noramai, how that balance changed? Uh, balance of life is something very, very important, especially for leaders, and we all know this. So how did your balance change, either for the good or for the bad, during this uh, quarantine? And, and what are those things that might be good that you will like to keep going into the future? Mm -hmm. um, maybe we should go back to Maria, if you're ready, or, or someone else. I mean, I, um, I, I think about what it would be like if I had a five-year-old, I mean, my kids were three and six during 9-11. So, you know, we lived through, um, uh, sorry about that. Are we there? We lived through a, a kind of tragic time as it were. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we've had to adjust with having two grown, so there's four adults living in our New York City apartment now. 
because I have a 22 year old and a 24 year old who are home now. Um, And actually, like I said, we've been able to kind of make the adjustment very quickly. We moved the studio into my apartment. Um, I think it was for us a little bit more of a psychological kind of, how do we, how do we do this? Mm I I know that one thing that when we go back to whatever it is that we recreate and reimagine, um, I will miss the security of having a meal every single night with my family. Mm -hmm. That is something that I I didn't have except for the full year after 9-11 when I wasn't traveling as a journalist. Um, This is the only other time when I've had that in my life. And so when I think of that, um, and I think that in my company, that mama bear, that everybody in our staff, in the first staff meeting after our quarantine, you know, we made an announcement. We said, you're going to be okay. Like, we're not looking to fire anybody. We're not downsizing. You're going to be okay. We're protecting you. And that in and of itself, I think, let the entire staff just kind of go, Mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. produce their best work. Mm-hmm. So you're always managing the house and you're managing the staff. Yeah. And I think what everybody in this group shows is that we're very agile, whether it's making sure, because mm-hmm. sweetie, Ana Marie, yo siempre tenía el toilet paper. I didn't have yeah. to go out and buy it because <laughs> I already had, my family will never make fun of me for having extra toilet paper <laughs> or paper towels. Never make fun of me. Um, so we we operate in those multiple different realities, and that's what makes this group, because we are we're multiple we're Latinas living and working and functioning and excelling in the United States of America. Therefore, we're survivors. Bam. Yeah, exactly. You know, for me, I think balance is is definitely harder. The line between work and home is is blurred more than ever and i was a teenage mom so i have a a 21 almost 22 year old and a three-year-old and uh and i remember from raising my my daughter um that i was always talking about work-life integration and uh, it wasn't necessarily the best thing but it was what made us successful um the way i'm spinning this new reality is uh is that i think i really appreciate my husband and i doing our best to show gender equity and so we talk about mommy's working, dada's working, um, and we're alternating bedtime. So, mm-hmm. you know, today dada's going to read a book, today mama's going to read a book. And so I'm really um, looking at this new reality with, <clears throat> with that set of appreciation. I think my son is being exposed to more, uh, more gender equity, and that's a great thing. In terms yeah. of what I want to keep moving forward, you know, I've made a practice of checking in on friends, checking in on colleagues checking in on family and so we put time in my calendar to do this and I think that is that is a practice that has been uh, beautiful for me beautiful for them and uh, and something I'd love to continue doing mm-hmm. and then the idea that we're constantly as we look at our week you know sifting through what's important and th- and, and making trade-off decision and calls on what we participate and what we what we choose not to there's so much uh, so much virtual junk out there. And so I, that practice of making sure that, that our time is meaningful is, is also something I want to keep. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Lily, w- would you like to share? Um, I'm going to start with the stuff I want to keep for sure. Definitely will second the whole thing of uh, connecting with either loved ones or high school friends that I hadn't seen in forever. Uh, and we always say, it, it can't believe it, it took a pandemic for us to make time for each other. So I think it really is putting that in perspective. And I really hope and pray that we all keep that going because there's no excuses. We're seeing that with technology, we, we can stay in touch with you know, your best girlfriend from high school or middle school. So I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, my boys, uh, they're uh, one soon to be five and seven. So it's very busy. They're very active um, and I do appreciate them realizing also the, the boundaries and moments of like, they literally, when they hear, see me with the little earbuds, they're like, mommy, estás en una llamada? Like they're always asking me, are you on a call? So they now are almost seeing these dynamics or with my husband, uh, which is kind of cool. Cause I think it's making it real that there is these moments and these spaces and they're in class, we're at work, but we're in the same place. And I hope we keep 
some of that connectivity and perspective. Um, yeah. I hope, and I, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna be one of those moms. I am not a fan of distance learning, the Zoom calls, the lack of connection that the kids have, the demands, on, because depending on the school, some of these are like very demanding. Um, is also making me realize how much we need humans in our lives and kids. Um, my, my kids love school, but, but el chiquito, the little one, is like, mommy, no quiero, no quiero, I don't want to, I don't want to go to a Zoom class. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no. So uh, we need to get back to normal. And what I like about that learning, not just for little kids, is that we are realizing that, yes, as technologically advanced as we are, we need people, we need hugs and kisses, and we need human touch to stay yeah. alive. So I am looking forward to that again, especially for us culturally. We're warm, we're touchy, we hug, we do all this stuff that now is it's not allowed. Um, but it's putting that in perspective, too. So definitely want to keep some of those precious moments at home. And I do want to uh, put a, you know, value and not take for granted um, human connections that I think before we were just thinking, oh, no, I have people there. Well, look how much you miss them when you don't have them. Yeah, that's true. Ana Marie. For me, I'm much more intentional about taking care of myself. So before I used to just sort of like work, work, work until... I fell and now I know like with through the pandemic I, I, I feel like I knew that that wouldn't work that I could like easily fall apart so I'm cooking really good meals every night um, I'm taking walks every morning I'm not a morning person but I'm walk, waking up early to go for walks I'm making sure to to try and sleep even if I'm not sleeping at least resting and just um, and, and scheduling myself in different ways you know since we are operating from uh, you know, New York all the way to California, I could easily be working, you know, from 7 a.m. East Coast time until, you know, 8 p.m. West Coast time. But I've like instituted real strong boundaries so that stuff doesn't bleed so that at least every night I can have uh, meals with my with my husband, which he, he's actually really delighted. And so am I because it's like we're spending so much time together. I brought my mom and it's really wonderful to have her. And then I get to see my brother. He's part of my bubble and his wife. So, you know, every weekend we're, we're together and, um, you know, we're playing games. We never haven't played games, you know, and, and <laughs> it's just very, it, it's very, even though we're all nervous, it's, it's very, there's a sweetness to it, which we will. Yeah will miss um, a, a simplicity um, and enjoying and appreciating all these little tiny things. Like yesterday mm -hmm. we were walking and there was a violinist in the park, uh, just doing, you know, by yourself, practicing the week before the bullfrogs were in the pond, just yelling and screaming and crazy loud. So it's very sweet. In terms of, um, I, I feel like women, we don't have compartments it's hard to stereotype but you know we you know all of these what you were saying about our balance this is just part of everything and it makes us maybe very res more resilient when you can use this muscle and I think men have it too I know my husband has it but you know some some women have it some women don't but I, I think all of us on this um, screen if you're able to balance that it gives you a resilience that is easy because when something doesn't go well in one area of your life you can just go on to another area like take solace from another um and that helps it's part of the balance i'm in in navajo my husband is navajo and he talks about walking in beauty and yeah really means um balance and how do you be balanced and that's the essence of like living a balanced life so i'm struggling with that all the time and trying to make it happen all right, I have, I have two uh, more questions and we, uh, we want to give some time for some participants to make some questions and Jimena is going to coordinate that. But I want to ask you uh, the last two questions and, and I invite you to be as brief as you can because they are like very specific. But if, if from the business standpoint, from what has made you leaders in your professions, in your careers, what is perhaps the most marked characteristic that will, that will show or that will um, 
uh, characterize your business going forward after this pandemic? Uh, what is going to affect, uh, what is going to be different? What is the main thing that is going to be different in the, in the foundation for philanthropy, Hispanics on philanthropy, on the capital markets for Noramai, or on your business, Lily, in, 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 in the services that you offer in, in, in your uh, journalistic uh, career and company, Maria, producing your, those contents? What is, what is going to change? So I'll just be really um, brief. Um, for us, very early on, we realized that, um, that COVID was a people of color story. Um, in, in many ways, it is a Latino and Latina story. In fact, in, yeah. I mean, black men are dying at very high numbers. Latino men are dying at very high, no high numbers. But I'm worried about the fact that this is moving into rural America and into the meat processing areas, which are all... Latino and Latina. Um, so for us, what's different is that we are actively understanding how to report this story in a way that we don't really see. Everybody else kind of makes a mention of it, mm -hmm. but we're trying to actually put a face to it um, in our journalism. So we dropped on Latino USA. You know, we had a, a doctor who was inside the intensive care unit at Bellevue who was talking about who's there. And she's like, it's the construction worker. Mm -hmm. It's the guy who's making your deli sandwiches that you never think is going to end up in an ICU. Okay. So for us, I think it's completely responding to this understanding, this narrative that this pandemic sadly is affecting specifically Latinos and Latinas and people of color. And we have a journalistic responsibility. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I think am I? I think for us, if we are going to explore investment into a company that was alive during during this COVID era, we're really going to dig into how they handled it. So, what was the impact? Um, what uh, mm -hmm. what changes did you did you make uh, internally? How did you pivot your business? What did you learn? How are you prepared for you know the next time uh, something like this occurs? So, for a founder to have that story really. Uh, able to tell the story succinctly around what made them survive, um, that'll be really important. Okay. Lily? <clears throat> um, this is going to sound weird, but this pandemic is making our business realize, my partner, our team, that the world is really small. And what that means is that we need to think bigger and our impact on footprint can indeed be bigger. So um, the way we're, for example, activating our, our big data analytics side, bringing insights to keep a pulse on how people uh, are changing their behaviors, their mindsets, their sentiment in real time across ethnicities, genders, generations, countries, had never been so valuable to the marketplace as it is right now. Um, so just for those that are watching, it's like, what's she talking about? So we, we have a technology that can scrape and mine every open source digital discussion and turn it into real time insights. So we're working with All right. every corporation you can think of to do that. But why am I saying that is like, it took a pandemic for us to realize that we're not thinking big enough. Um, yeah. and that sounds crazy when there's so many limitations, but I think it's a challenge that we're taking up and caring responsibly. So we empower uh, more people with this cultural intelligence to make better decisions. Exactly. All right, Ana Marie. I think that it's imperative if we're going to come through um, the pandemic successfully and have a working democracy that we double down on the census and everybody being, vote, be, being counted and everybody's showing up to vote because that Latinos are being impacted. Part of this is because Latinos are so often invisible in policy and in decision making. And so that we're, we are very, very visible and that we're very loud and that we're unapologetically <laughs> demanding and, and insisting on what yeah. we prefer because what's happening with access to healthcare, what's happening with the di digital divide, who gets to work from home and who doesn't, that's terrible. Um, Specifically with regards to philanthropy, I think that philanthropy has let go of a lot of the rigidity um, that they've always um, had. And for example, I see a lot of us now that we're funding small businesses and entrepreneurs, whereas before it was like, no, 
to get funding, you must be a nonprofit. And now um, we're seeing, at least I'm seeing, um, how we're also understanding that the backbone of our economy is our small businesses and if, that we need to invest in those, them as well. Um, because the PPP is not, for example, Latinos, um, we're 91% and Latin, um, Maria did a piece on this one on, on the PPPs. 91% of our Latino businesses are not going to get uh, the PPP loans. And so we need to buttress them up um, because mm -hmm. they are our givers. They are the ones that will be investing in our communities. And so that's, it's essential to, to keep them of course. going through this period. Okay. Now, I want, to, I want to give the opportunity to some of our participants to ask a couple of questions. Uh, you, you don't have to, you don't have all to respond to all the questions from the audience. So uh, Jimena is going to read us some of the questions that have been arriving and uh, whoever wants to respond, uh, you, can, you can raise your hand and, and then uh, you can talk. And if you want to answer, welcome. If you don't, uh, we can go to the next question. But before go, uh, doing that, I want to make a, a little announcement that we always, we, every, every year, we host our Maestro Awards for Leadership in San Francisco, in the Bay Area. And uh, we are looking for a candidate in the category of community service. So maybe you and Marie, and maybe of course, Noramai, Lily, and Maria can, if you know someone, uh, doesn't have to be Latina, it can be Latino too, but uh, we're looking for a candidate for the Maestro Award in community service in the Bay Area. So oh, that's, that's a little announcement. Uh, if you have someone, maybe you can email to me later or, or on separate message. And now I'm going to uh, go to Jimena so she can uh, uh, ask the first questions from the attendance. And I really want to uh, thank all the people that have uh, entered the conference uh, for, your, for watching this and for your support. So Jimena, go ahead. Um, so a lot of the questions are actually really similar. I think everyone has so many things in their head right now. But one of the questions that has been coming up a lot is um, what should be the initial responsibility of the younger generation who they're looking to be, who are looking for their future in corporate world and what should be their role in the upliftment of the country's economy? Who wants to answer that first? If there's any answer. Um, okay. I'll, I'll give some words of wisdom. Um, I actually was popular and unpopular with something I said on TV last week, actually related to this. <laughs> um, young people, young people right now, we know the unemployment rate is, has skyrocketed, obviously, you know, I mean, I've had to forelow people, some are back, some are not, so it's the reality, but any young person out there that is given and offered a job right now, please take it and stay current and stay challenged. Even if it's a job that is not your ideal job or it's in a different swim lane or it's in another category of industry that you really don't care for so much. Why am I saying that? And it depends from state to state because staying in your unemployment benefits is very tempting. And I know some young people are declining job offers because I've had a couple do that. So please do not let yourself be out of a job market when it's really hard to get a new job and throw yourself if you're blessed enough to be given the opportunity. So that would be my advice. And also take all the free online learning that is available right now and beef up that resume and stay out there. Instead of being cooped up, go out. And if you're given an offer, grab it and take it from there. <laughs> yeah, my daughter is uh, graduating college. We, we were supposed to be in San Francisco last weekend actually for her graduation. And her job prospects have just about disappeared as she's mm. uh, targeting marketing in, in the music industry. Uh, my advice to her is really about value. 
right? It's about looking at industries she was interested in and trying to find a, a value add way to approach them. So she spent a summer working for um, two music, uh, two record labels. And so I said, what if you do this work? You know what the work is. What if you do this work independently and then you bring them something? You know, think about if you were in that job, what would you be doing right now? If you had the responsibility to be in there and to keep your job, how would, how would this job shift? What would you do differently? And now reach out to your contacts and, and talk about this. And so I'm pushing her to really think about value and to, to do more work up front to really understand how a role she's interested in will change or morph this year and, and to be able to communicate that to people she's talking to. So that is my advice. Yeah. Um, find a value add way to break in. Big one. Okay, and anyone else? Uh, okay, Ana Marie. Um, a lot of us are hiring now, but we're not hiring employees, we're hiring consultants. Mm. So add that to what Lily said, maybe you can at least get a consulting um, gig. Hopefully in January, we can make those consultants into employees and you'll be the first one in. Um, and so that's a good way to try at least on the on the, on the Yeah. And, and I guess that, I mean, every experience uh, is going to build up for your uh, later bio and your later, you know, resume, uh, even if it's not, uh, as Lily was saying, your ideal or your perfect. I think, I think uh, younger generations were growing a little bit, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I want to say, uh, taking from granted that they will go to exactly the, the job they wanted. And at least in my time, I needed to do a lot of hours mm -hmm. before even getting an opportunity for a paid job in the, in the area that I wanted. So maybe we're just going back some years to what it, it was before. So, um, uh, Jimena, do we have another question? We, we have uh, five more minutes. So a few of the viewers are asking, since everyone's working in diff very different uh, fields, how are you going to be doing, are you still going to be doing work remotely with your team or what are the next steps for your teams and how do you see things are going to be changing in the future? Look, I'll, I'll jump in right now. I think for us, um, we are thinking about how we can go back to reporting in a way that makes sense where we're actually out on the street, but at the same time, most of us are based here in New York. Um, and I think, the truth is, is that a lot of us are thinking we have to, I'm, I'm freaked out about the fact that the rest of the country is already opening up when we're mm -hmm. still closed down. Yeah. I think we're thinking about how do we re how do we reintegrate as not only as business people who are running businesses or a news operation. Um, there's a human aspect to this that we have to respond to. We've all been traumatized and we've all been through trauma and we have to slowly reintegrate and be really respectful because otherwise mm -hmm. we just can't have more lives lost. So it's got to be yeah. slow and respectful. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, I can tell you that I was one of those lucky ones that talked my way out of our office lease in New York. <laughs> that was very painful by the way, on kind of putting that case forward. Um, and I don't see how financially and personally that would make sense for us in at least the New York office. Uh, part of what Maria is saying, I, can't, I couldn't bear it in my heart in knowing that I'm making my team commute to Manhattan to our office. Why? Um, on the flip side, I think I've become or we've become a lot more flexible, realizing that if anything, this pandemic has taught us that you can have the right person and the right talent anywhere, instead of being so close-minded that they need to be in my office, let's say in New York, which is kind of exciting because now like the world opened up. Uh, I'd rather have the right person anywhere than not the right fit in an office just because mm. we're stuck to that way of working. So mm. I'm not sure. Right now we don't have an office lease because we got out of it. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> we were supposed to into our new New York office on April 1st and we got out of that one too and it's not going to happen now 
um, I think it will be, some people want to go back to the office. So mm -hmm. I think we're going to go into uh, whatever you want, uh, depending on the preference, because those that have little children want to leave home and be able to work in a quiet place. So, but um, I agree with you, Lily. It's like whoever is the best for the job and that they were at a disadvantage before because if there's three people in an office and then three people not, the people that are together tend to monopolize, but now this levels the playing field and everybody um, being on the Zoom call. Um, it's just a, a great equalizer in terms of the remote working. Right. Okay. So um, I, re I think uh, we have just time enough to say thank you and recap. Uh, I really want to, to say uh, from the bottom of our hearts in Latino leaders, you four are uh, icons in the Latino community, the Latina community, uh, and we really admire your stories. I think what you are doing for your organizations and for others are, are really good examples of what the Latino community needs to do. Uh, I agree that our community has been hit hard, but at the same time, I, I also am convinced that our community is the one that is gonna work hard, harder, to make us all come out of these. So uh, with examples like you four, uh, I'm sure we're gonna do it. So I wanna thank again, uh, Nora Mai uh, Cadena from, uh, from Amila Capital. She is the founding partner and she has uh, had a lot of other ventures as well, uh, a pretty uh, a successful uh, women, uh, I mean, sorry, Latina woman in this uh, field. So thank you for uh, being with us today. Maria Hinojosa, uh, an admired journalist for many, many years. Thank you, Maria. Uh, you are also a, a great icon in the uh, Hispanic media in this country. So thank you for all your contributions and, and your example. Uh, Ana Marie Arguilagos, thank you. Uh, you, you. I mean, your advices and your, sh uh, your sharing, uh, your thoughts were great. And uh, I think that the foundation that you are directing is a great one that needs to um, lever the, the, the involvement of Latinos in philanthropy, for sure, in, this, in these uh, days. And Lily, uh, a size uh, company, very successful, uh, large dreams, large projects. Uh, we thank you for sharing also your, your views with us, and, and, and uh, we wish you success, and if there's something we can help all of you, uh, please let us know. So um, we're gonna uh, post some information about this webinar in our website later on this week, but uh, for now, it's been a pleasure to speak to all of you. Uh, uh, we have like one minute uh, for everybody to say goodbye. Ciao. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Gracias. Ciao, ciao.